we, uh, it's not just a, a feeling or something that the world has uh, so much polluted and corrupted, but God, we see your example with your only son, Jesus, and how he did nothing to please himself, but only to, uh, to please others, and finally gave the ultimate sacrifice of laying his life down for us. And so, Lord, help us to be like you. Remember, you said, be perfect, even as your Father who is in heaven is perfect. And you, Jesus, you said, follow me. And, uh, and we see that Paul said, follow me, even as I follow Christ. And so, Lord Jesus, help us to, uh, of all the attributes, love is, uh, is the greatest of all. And so, God, tonight, just help us to uh, really uh, not only learn the reality of it, but to be convicted, to want to grow in love. Uh, if we don't grow in anything else, I pray we'll grow in love. We think of what Paul said to Timothy, that the goal of all his instruction was that he would have love out of a pure heart, a good conscience, and a genuine faith. And so, Lord, I, I pray this for myself. I pray it for my family. I pray it for uh, all my spiritual family, uh, that each one of us, uh, will pursue love uh, with all of our hearts and tonight that you'll use that to drive us further to be like you, God, who loved the world so much you gave your only son. And so we thank you for your word tonight and your presence through your word and through your Holy Spirit here with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we've been going through Corinthians and uh, last week we finished off on chapter 12 and... Uh, uh, looked at a lot of the gifts and saw how that they're like a body so that everybody is a member. You're a part of the body. And uh, so now every one of you in here realize if you're not doing good, I'm not doing good. And the rest of us aren't doing good. If you're doing great, then I'm doing great. And all of us are doing great because it's just like a body. One part suffers, we all suffer. If one part rejoices or gets glory, we all get glory. So how are you doing? Great. great. I thought I was doing pretty good tonight. So if you're doing great, I'm doing great. If you're suffering, I'm suffering. This is how God wants us to be to one another. I mean, talk about unity. Uh, we're not just united. We're one. We're more than united. We're the same body. And so that's, I tell you, that's why I have a little bit of an ulterior motive. <clears throat> Uh, wanting to care for you because when I'm caring for you it affects me because if you're not doing good I'm not doing good and not only that Jesus said whatever you do to the least of these you do to me so uh, he says we are his body so we're a body and we and he says we are his body so uh, just let this permeate in your mind that you are very important and nobody in this room does not have something special to contribute to the body. And if you're not functioning good, you know, it's like having a leg that you just drag around and the other leg has to limp along to carry you along. But if this leg goes forward, God wants you to use your gift that you've got and take the next leg forward and the next leg. And a body doesn't function very well if both legs aren't working, if both limbs aren't working, if all fingers aren't working, if both eyes aren't working. And so, so we're one. But now he says, he talked about a lot of the gifts, remember? But he said, I want you to especially desire the greater gifts. Those greater gifts that he commands all believers to desire. It wasn't the greatest gift or a great gift, but it was the greater gifts. All three of them, isn't there? The first one was what? Yay? Right there, Moose, you're on. The first one is? Apostles. Well, I was going backwards. Oh, backwards. Okay, teaching. The first one that you should yeah, the first one you should get is teaching. The second one is? Prophet. prophet to be a prophet. And the third one is? Apostle. Apostle. Where God will take your gift because you're so effective in time, he wants to use you to expand. Just not too dissimilar to some corporations that get big. And, and, and the top people in that corporation that have the most experience or skill, many times they will expand and go to other places to help establish and advance their business. Our business is what? Winning. Winning people to Christ and, and 
Discipling, right. I think of it in two words, win and build. Just win and build. Win the lost, build the believers. And, and Jesus calls that his church, the group. So what we're doing, Jesus' business is building a group. And he's building local groups in every city. And so we're wanting to build a group. So I'm not only wanting to build you and me and each one of us individually. That's one thing. But a master, a wise master builder like the Apostle Paul said he was building the group. It's quite a different thing to just kind of be one-on-one. -on -one. But as you learn how to build individuals, then you can learn to build two or three, eventually 10, maybe 20, maybe hundreds, thousands. And so, the, but Jesus isn't building individuals. He says, I'm building my group, church. That's a, an assembly of people. He really wants a body. He doesn't want lone wolves out here uh, going on your, your own independent way. So he wants us to be a body. And, and the only way we can be effective is if we're plugged in to one another. Nothing in my body can be effective by itself. Nothing in your body can be effective by yourself. He also says later we're like a family. If you have a little, you know, James has little Eden and, and, and Ezekiel, and if, if one of them somehow could have a, the idea that they can just go off on their own, they wouldn't be nearly as effective. But they've got to be in a body. And then even as adults, you've got James and Maddie. What if, what if James just thought, well, I'll just kind of wander off, drift off on my own? No, he would lose his helpmate. He would lose Maddie, wouldn't he? Or Maddie, she wouldn't have somebody to help if, if she wandered off. So God has family. He, he designed, remember in Genesis, God said, let us make man in our image. How close is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? They're pretty close, aren't they? Jesus prayed that we would be one like he is with the Father. So that's what he's doing. And when he comes back, Whatever is lacking, he's going to finish, and we'll be one. So if we want to please him, this will be our mindset right now. And that's why he wants us to desire the greater gifts. You all have a gift. They're all serving gifts. We've all looked at that. But he wants you, as you use your gift, as you grow in love, as we're going to look at tonight, to be able to uh, actually then teach, instruct others, to be able to instruct them in truth. And then in time, like a prophet, they instruct in an inspiring way. That's the major difference between a, a, a teacher and a prophet. A prophet inspires more. They can comfort better. And a teacher can instruct on verses of comfort. A prophet has, has the growth and the maturity where they can console and comfort or challenge or rebuke or motivate more. And God wants you, all men and women, to be that. And then eventually he wants you to have your influence spread even outside of this city, where you're a part, just like Jesus had a team. And he was back in Capernaum, his home a lot of times, but he went out and others went with him. Paul, he was back at his home, but they went out and others went with him. God doesn't want you, unlike the typical missionary mentality of many, a single girl wanders off somewhere to uh, Mongolia or some guy goes here or there yonder. He wants a team. So he wants us as a body with our local church and whenever we get to a point where God may want us to spread out with some of us with an apostolic team, it's to be with that apostolic team, not by yourself, not in, as individuals. So tonight, we're going to look at uh, the end of chapter 12. He says in verse, uh, the last verse, which I've got up in the screen here, uh, and, and as you all know, this is, this is my paraphrase, looking at the scripture and, uh, and, and looking at the Greek and putting it together the best that that I feel the spirit of it is. He says, uh, however, finally, verse 31, everyone be zealous in spirit for earnestly desiring the greater gifts, which were the first three gifts, apostle, prophet, and teacher. But now I'll show you something greater than the greatest gifts, how to conduct yourself. How to conduct yourself. And this is greater than the gifts. Now, look, I hope all of you desire earnestly to be an apostle, to be a prophet to be a teacher. But you know, that can take time. But the greatest thing takes no time. You can have the greatest thing right now, and it's greater than if you were an apostle. It's greater than if you're a prophet. And you can have this tonight, right now, the greatest. 
and it's love. I think that's so exciting. You can have the greatest, which is love. And now we'll look at this, and I have this titled, uh, The Most Wasted Life. So first God says, I'm going to show you how you can really waste your life. I'm sad to say, many are wasting their lives. You can cry see in this criteria if you're wasting your life. The first one, he says, if I could speak the languages of every human, and in the Greek text, he's talking about every language. If you could speak every language, some were thinking, boy, I, I can speak in tongues, and, and God had that gift. And they thought, wow, that's good. He said, look, I don't care if you could speak every language in the world of every man. I don't care if you could speak what the angels speak. If you don't have love, you'd only be a noise. <laughs> you'd only be a noise. That's kind of annoying. Some Christians can be annoying, too. Without love, those gifts are annoying. That's worthless. That's worthless. If I prophesy knowing all mysteries and all knowledge. Now, that's incredible. No prophet that prophesied knows all mysteries or all knowledge. But if I did, and if I had all faith so I could remove all mountains, but not have love, I am nothing. And I think it's interesting, John and I were talking about the sequence. The first one says, we're only a noise. The second one, a judgmental noise. Okay, good, John. A judgmental noise, yeah, well, that, that was a good thought. It's kind of like being condemning and uh, being judgmental. But the second one, just think, if you could be a prophet, I mean, and you should desire to be a prophet, but you can have love right now. And he says, if you... Ha have all the, no, all the mysteries, all knowledge. You have all faith to remove mountains. Do not have love. I am nothing. So this talks about what we are intrinsically. I am nothing. Or one says, I'm a nobody. I'm an absolute nobody. I'm a zero. That's incredible. Can you imagine a prophet that could have mountains go moving off the place, do all mysteries? But if I don't have love, I'm nothing. The third category, he says, if I give everything I have to feed others. Many translations say the poor. That may be implied, but it's not in the Greek. If you have possessions where you feed, you're giving everything you've got, everything. You know, I think, wow, now I'm really counting for something. But he says, the second category, if I sacrifice my body to be burned as a martyr, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Oh, wrong prophets. Thank you. I want to get that P-H. Whoops, did I spell it right? P-R-O-F. There we go. Thanks, guys. That's great. Prophets. Yeah, it profits me nothing. <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty good. But think of that. You know, when people make investments, they make it to get some kind of a return. And really, God wants us to make spiritual investments to get eternal treasure. So that motivation is not wrong. If it's for eternal treasure, to sacrifice, to give free will offerings, which is more than what a tithe really is. And if we give everything, God wants us to do that, to profit. But if we don't have love, it profits us nothing. Wow. Okay, so those, that, that's the wasted life no matter how great you are. And, and God just hit me with it earlier today, saying, you know, Jim, this is exciting because some people think, boy, I really want to be a teacher. And I know some that have prayed for that, pressed for that for years and may still not be recognized as an elder teacher. But it, it just dawned on me, the greatest is love. And you can qualify for that tonight. And that puts you above apostle, prophets, and teachers. And that's what we should pursue more than anything else. And when you pursue that, this other will come along. You'll eventually be a teacher. You'll eventually be able to inspire in what you share. Okay, now what's really great is God says, this is what real love is. Real love suffers long from others and is still kind. It's kind of two words here in the Greek. It's not just being kind. And it's not being, some translations say, being patient. And that's a good one, isn't it? And, but you know, what I really think about is 
it, it intrigues me, as it probably has you if you've thought much about this, that the first definition of love is patience. That's, that's incredible. So if you can be patient, you can be greater than an apostle, a prophet, a teacher, if you can be patient. And if you got the spirit in you, you can. But the, the, the Greek meaning here doesn't mean patient in just a, a natural way. It means, and really, you don't exercise patient if you don't feel you're suffering in some way. So being patient always comes in with you feeling like you're losing something. You're losing time. You're missing out on this, or you're missing out on that. I'll tell you one way that's helped me. When I feel kind of frustrated if I'm having to wait for somebody and not wanting to be patient, and it gears up into me, I have an alternative. With every bad thing, if you have an alternative that triggers a, a good thing, it's, it's, it's an incredible way to grow in Christ. So the alternative with me is to start praying for that person that I'm suffering long and waiting for or having to be patient with. Maybe it's not waiting for them to come. Maybe it's to be patient with how they are, with what they're doing. And, and what that triggers in me then is, hey, I'm aware of this, so I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to pray for that brother. I'm going to pray for that sister. And if you do that, God will give you grace. He'll give you power to be patient. It'd be amazing how patient. Sometimes I've pulled out, I know Roland, for example, I know carries, and I've done this a lot of times with my little pocket New Testament. Uh, now that I wear glasses I, and, and use the computer, it's the little, you know, little mobile device. But if you're waiting for somebody, you can pull out a verse that you're memorizing. We want to memorize 1 Corinthians 13. We're, we're all doing that. Just think, how many times this week you may have to wait for somebody or something if you just take those spare moments when you're waiting for somebody or something, you could memorize. And when you start doing that, that'll affect you. But he says, love is patient. So you're suffering, but it says in the, new, the authorized version, love suffers long and is patient. So the harder you're suffering and the longer you're suffering is the degree of patience you've got. It always relates to duration of time and the intensity and many translations says, suffers long and is what? And is kind. So some of us are patient, but we're not very kind when it finally comes to it. We're angry, we get upset, or whatever it might be. Moose, you had a thought. Oh, yeah, uh, the whole patience thing as well, as you were saying, the alternative thing. So it really depends on how you're waiting also. You know, if you're waiting for somebody and you're just like, oh, right. oh, 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 yeah. you're not really being patient. <laughs> right. You know? Right. No, that's not really loving. It's just like, oh, it's always late. Oh, I'm yeah, just, yeah. You know, that's just, right. Whatever it be, you know. So. Yeah, that's right. And that's why in the, in the text here it says, and is still kind. Mm -hmm. And is still kind. So a lot of us are kind to people, but are we kind when we have to be patient? Okay, so that's the first quality. Second one is love will not be jealous or envy of others or have envy for others. Oh. Uh, in other words, to be happy whatever you've got, to not be wanting what someone else has, to be content. Barb and I were just talking earlier today about the verse in, in Timothy where it says, uh, uh, godliness with contentment is great gain. Think of that. When we're envious or jealous, it's often because we want something that somebody else has, something we don't have. But God says if you're godly, in other words, if you're being righteous, and you're content, you've got riches, you're wealthy, you've got great gain. Contentment is a, is a major thing. It says in Philippians chapter 4, let your, uh, your contentment, is the idea of the word, be seen by all people. So godliness with contentment, and that relates, that's really the opposite of being jealous or envious, wanting something, instead of being content what God has given you. Because God has given you something. And not only that, if somebody else has something, God has allowed them to have it. And you don't want to say, hey, God, you did wrong. I want what you gave them. And it's a, really, it's a defilement against God himself when you stop and think about it. In fact, really, all these areas of love come in to understanding God because you're not a victim of anybody. You're not a victim of any circumstance. God, it says in, John, in Acts 17, where you were born, and when you were born, God ordained it before the foundation of the world. And all your circumstances in life 
have been determined, predetermined through when you were born and where you were born. If you were born an hour later or a year later or in another country or another century, everything would be different. Uh, if you were born just one day later, just one day, everything could have been different. So uh, God has ordained everything in your life. And so that's why, we, that's why we can show love because we believe God is in control. Love will not boast, it will not brag, it will not look arrogant or superior. Here it talks about the two areas. It relates to the heart and it relates to the countenance. It doesn't have, uh, it doesn't boast or brag in what it says, but this word also in the Greek gives the implication of how we look. Uh, by looking arrogant or looking superior. And, uh, you know, sometimes maybe you should take a look in the mirror. You know, we look in the mirror and we try to look pretty, don't we? Have you ever thought of looking in the mirror and saying, do I have a look of superiority or do I have a, a look of a, of a humble person? Do we ever look in the mirror and think, how is my look? Do I look sweet and kind and humble? Or do I look a little bit kind of proud and arrogant? The Bible says in Proverbs, a countenance um, is a good thing, that if one has a good countenance. And a countenance, of course, is reflected by our heart, and that's why it's in the same verse here. If I'm proud or I'm boastful, then my look will be that way. I feel superior. Love will not do this. Verse 5, love will not be rude. There's Many times these Greek words, and that's why sometimes the Amplified Bible is kind of good because translators oftentimes, it'll be one Greek word and they'll take and put one English word with it. And that's fine, but many times in the Greek, there's two or three words that that, that Greek word could mean or, or amplifies that word. And so sometimes you kind of lose a meaning to it. And I think you do in this particular one. Many translations say, will not act unbecoming. Well, unbecoming if you think about it, that kind of covers a lot of the waterfront. Some, some translations will say one word, some will say another. I've taken several of what the, the Greek uh, fuller meaning could be. Would not be rude or unmannerly or disrespectful or indecent in any way. Think about that for a minute. Unmannerly? Love? Because you see, if you're unmannerly or if you're rude, you're not really showing honor to someone else, are you? When we're mannerly, when we put others first, this is another form of really love. And, uh, and mind you, all these things are made so you'll be more like Christ. So remember chapter 9 and 10, it talks about winning people. Um, you know, we read that book that was so popular, How to Win Friends and, or how to win friends and Influence People. Nothing is more powerful than really what the Scripture has in that. And love is the most powerful thing thing to win friends and influence people. I want to mention this too. You know the, 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 the place that you're, the, you're tested the most, that, that is really your acid test of, uh, of being all these qualities of love? Guess where that is? Three guesses and the first two don't count. Your family. Your family. Absolutely. Your family. In your home. In the privacy of your home. With your your wife or your husband or your brother or your sister or your, or your son or your daughter or your father or your mother, how you are in that context is usually your bottom line. That's usually where you, you are. You know, it's funny. There was a cartoon. I can't, I don't know if you can picture it, but it was, a, it was a man and a woman and they were just arguing and arguing and the doorbell rang and the woman came to the door and said, hi, come on in and just smiled and was so happy looking. Boom, changed just like that to this stranger that came in. But to that person that was a part of their family, their attitude was different. So how you are in your home is really the bottom line. How I treat my wife, how I treat my son Titus, my son James and Maddie, how I treat them is, is really my bottom line. I can be pretty nice to all of you guys here for the next two or three hours when you come in. You can think I'm pretty great, huh? But when I'm all day long with my wife, with my sons, uh, how I am with them is really how my love is. Not really nearly as much as how I am with you. And it's the same way with you. How you are in your home, with your son, with your mom, with your brother, with your sister, with your dad, with your father, how you are in your home. That's the bottom line. And if you're strong there, 
you'll be even that much stronger outside to others. And so we need to not be rude or unmannerly or disrespectful or indecent in any way to those that we're closest with. And then the next verse, it goes on to say, it won't think about having its way or what it wants. This is so strong, it won't think about having its way or what it wants. Most of us tend to just always think about what we want and not what others want. Love will not be thinking about what you want. It won't, you'll only be thinking about what others want or your way. Love is not touchy or gets irritated or gets upset. You know, some people are just, you kind of like walking on eggshells with them. You got to be real careful, don't you? Love isn't that way. Love, I think of the verse in Psalms, it says, uh, great peace have they who love thy law, and nothing will offend them. Don't you love to be around somebody that's not real touchy, where you got to be real careful what you say, because, you know, they'll just get offended real easy, or if you don't do things just right, uh, they'll be real critical. Love is not this way. In verse 6, uh, it has no joy with anyone or anything that is bad or unjust. This is kind of interesting. What, when you're in the context of thinking, it's many times there's things that aren't particularly good and sometimes out of peer pressure, we don't show displeasure in it. But love isn't always just what you might call bubbly happy. It also does not rejoice it is not glad, it takes no pleasure in anything that's bad or wrong. But it rejoices and it shows joy in everything that is true and good. Verse 7, it will suffer to cover for others. The tra some translation says it bears all things. This is kind of an interesting word in the Greek. It has the idea that of covering. In fact, the root word came from the Greek word of roof, roof in a house. So it has the idea of covering, but it also has the idea of covering for others and bearing up under it, suffering to cover for others. When somebody does wrong, do you like to expose it or do you like to insulate it and cover for them and defend them in a sense? And that's what this talks about. It's not just covering for them or just uh, when there's no problem, but when it says bears all things, it doesn't matter how bad it is, how hard it is on you, you cover for them. That's what real love is. It believes the best of others. It always expects the best in others. It faithfully defends others. So these are the, the different characteristics of love. Does anybody have some thoughts you want to mention on this or add to it that in your reading or that you've thought through about it? Um, this is probably the best definition in the whole Bible of love. And this is why... Um, this is why I think it's good to memorize this. Many times, endless times, I would finish a quiet time in the morning, and before I'd go out the door, I'd stand right at the door by myself, and I would quote this chapter. And especially I'd get to the part, and I learned it in the King James Authorized Version, where it says, love suffers long and is kind. Love envies not. Love vaunts not itself. It's not puffed up. Does not besave itself unseemly. Seeks not its own. Is not easily provoked thinks no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, rejoices in truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endure all things. Love never fails. And I'll just, I'll go through each one of those, usually slower than that, and think about that so I'll be that way when I walk out that door, that day, with who I'm around. This is how love is. This is how I want to be every day. Okay, we're going to kind of go into another area, lest somebody has a thought or comment here. You need to realize that this love has been put right in the middle of chapter, between the portion chapter 12 and chapter 14. It was given in the area of gifts. Why? Because just like we see today with gifts, many times ones feel superior, some feel arrogant, some think they're better than others. And so Paul was giving different categories. He was saying, look, think about the body. Now he says, think about love. This is greater than all the gifts. And so even though we learn a lot about love, the real purpose of him in the context of putting it here is to have it in relationship to gifts. And the next portion picks back up on that because if you recall, 
uh, earlier in chapter 12, he was talking about a lot of different gifts. He was talking about having the gift of special knowledge, uh, of a special uh, a word of wisdom, and all, all sorts of different gifts that ones could have. Uh, e even though he did identify the greater gifts, he listed a lot of other gifts. I think that this portion goes on to show that some of these gifts are temporary, and here's why, because I think the text bears this out. <clears throat> Verse 8 says, love will not stop. Love will not stop. It'll never cease. But these special prophecies and knowledge will fall away and tongues will cease. That's the thrust of this verse. It can say it in different ways, but that's the thrust. Love does not stop, but these special prophecies, the special knowledge, which it talked about in chapter 12, they will fall away. They'll come to an end. And tongues, it says here, will also cease. Now, these special prophecies and special knowledge are only partial. It's only partial. Verse 10 goes on to say, but when the perfect comes, the completion, or this partial, shall cease, so it will be useless, or cease. I put in there in brackets, the partial, in context, is the special prophecies, or special knowledge or tongues. It's very clear in the context what's going to cease when the perfect comes. So in verse 10, you need to define what the perfect is. Some people think the perfect means Jesus when he comes back. And I can appreciate that. It can be, uh, I think, misunderstood that way. But this word perfect is mentioned, only, is mentioned 20 times in the New Testament. In all 20 times, it never refers to Jesus. It never refers to Jesus coming back. It never refers to God. In every case, it refers to being complete, what gets complete. Or, most of the time, or very often, it refers to growing up to being mature. It means like a young person who is younger and now they've become an adult. And in fact, when it says in, uh, um, in the scriptures, in, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, be perfect as God is perfect. The word there, it's the same word. It means to be mature, uh, like God. Uh, uh, in, in Colossians, it uses that word, to be perfect, to come uh, complete in Christ, to grow up. And so the word perfect here, like I said, uh, nowhere in the New Testament does this word ever refer to, to God or Jesus, but it refers to becoming complete or being full to the full measure. And it says, but when the perfect comes, this partial will cease. So what is the partial? In the, in the verses before, it says what is partial. It's the special prophecies, the special knowledge, and tongues. That's what it says. The verse right before it says that's the partial. Now, think about this. So then, what would be the perfect? When Paul was writing this, it was around 50 A.D., and the majority of the New Testament was not even written. Half of the Gospels were not written. Most of the epistles were not written. This was the, one of the beginning revelations of books. And Paul, by revelation, knew that the, 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 uh, there was going to be a lot more Scripture. And so uh, the, the canon, all the revelation of God's Word, had not been complete yet. In fact, the word perfect here is also used in, first, in James, I think it's chapter 1 and I think verse 25, where it says to look into the perfect law of Christ. The word perfect there means the same as it means here, the full law, the complete law, to look into the perfect law of liberty. And so he's talking about the complete, uh, perfect and the completion of, I think, the revelation. And when that comes, when we have the full the scriptures, because God, by, God uh, Paul, by revelation, knew there was going to be a lot more of the New Testament that would be inspired and come in, just think about it. All they had was the Old Testament, and, uh, and, and, and so they, were, they weren't getting all the knowledge. Think of all the body of truth. If you did, they didn't have 2 Corinthians. They didn't have half of the Gospels. The Gospel of Luke hadn't been written. The Gospel of John hadn't been written. Uh, almost all the epistles had not been written. 
James, Peter, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Hebrews had not been written, Revolution had not, Revelation had not been written, so it wasn't complete yet, so it was partial. And so God, with this partial, just like in the Old Testament, in this transition, God gave inspiration to help people gain truth. But they looked, even like in the Old Testament, it says in Peter, uh, they weren't able to see the whole thing because why? They didn't have the whole counsel of God yet. They didn't have all the body of God's revelation. Or as it says in James, the perfect law, in other words, the full, complete law. So, uh, so what he's saying here is the, the special prophecies that they were getting, the special knowledge that people were getting, God was inspiring them until and as the whole scripture was coming in to place. So uh, you can think the perfect whatever you want to think, but whatever you can't think is what no place that's used in the New Testament. It's never used for Jesus or Christ or Christ's return. So you can think of it whatever you want. In my opinion, it could only be Jesus, God, and or his return, or it has to be the completion of the word of God. And uh, in context, he's talking about knowledge. He's talking about understanding. As we get the completion of the word of God, uh, that is knowledge, isn't it? It is the word of God. Now, to further confirm what I believe the perfect is here, is the analogies he uses. He uses two analogies, a child and a mirror. And as I said before, this word perfect is oftentimes used to grow up to be mature like an adult. And that's the first analogy he gives. He says, it's like when I was a child, I used to sound like a child, I understood like a child, and I thought like a child. But when I became a man, I did away with what was childish. So as the believers, they were young, they were immature in their understanding, the whole canon of scripture had not been given, but once the whole canon of scripture and all the revelation of God was getting given, now they didn't keep acting like little children. They didn't speak, in fact, the word in, the, in Isaiah where it talks about tongues, it uses the word babble, like a little child babbling. Well, they, they make sounds, they're talking, but it's very immature talk compared to when they grow up. And so the analogy here is very fitting with uh, uh, being complete. Verse 12 goes on and gives the, the, the other analogy, which is also given in the book of James. Now it's like looking into a mirror without full light, but later we'll see the clear face reflected. And that's exactly what James said. He said, when you look into the perfect law, he said it's like looking into a mirror. When you look into a, a, a mirror and don't do what the Word of God says. So the mirror reflects the Word. You look into the Word. If you go away and don't do what it says, it's like looking into a mirror and forgetting uh, what you looked like. And so we have confirmed here uh, also in the scripture how that the mirror refers to seeing the face of Christ, the reflection of truth, as James said. And so he gives the two analogies here that flow right into this area of having uh, being a child and immature versus growing up when we have the full knowledge of God through the full canon of God. And then the mirror, which... We, they had a lot that reflected God, all the Old Testament. Most of the New Testament wasn't there. So they, they had a lot of reflection, but it wasn't clear because they hadn't had all the revelation. Ephesians hadn't been written. Colossians hadn't been written. Uh, think of all those books that haven't been written that we have so much more understanding. Uh, but when they were all written, they didn't need this special revelation. They didn't need special uh, uh, um, knowledge that people would give it but rather they could go to the perfect word of God, or as it says in James, the, the perfect law. <clears throat> now the knowledge, again, notice it says, now the knowledge is partial, but in time we'll have the completed knowledge, the full knowledge. Now it's partial. Now we have only some of the, the revelation of God. Uh, they, they, they were getting revelation by first, this first letter in Corinthians, but 2 Corinthians hadn't been written. There's a lot in 2 Corinthians by itself. If you've not read it, you, you don't have the full knowledge. Um, now this, it, this chapter ends saying this. But these three, faith, hope, and love, will continue. And I have in brackets there, after the, after the temporary gifts cease. 
That's the point. The, the word in the Greek says it will remain. They continue. They carry on compared to what he was talking about. And the three things he was talking about was tongues, special prophecy that was coming in, and special knowledge that they were getting. That was not going to carry on when the revelation came. But faith would carry on, hope would carry on, and love would carry on. But then he says the greatest, but love is the greatest. He says it's greater than faith and hope. And how is it greater? It's even greater than faith and hope because only love continues forever. You see, when Christ comes back and we see Christ, we won't be hoping for him any longer. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We won't be having to exercise faith or hope uh, in Jesus once he's there. We have the substance of him. So uh, all of this, the whole context flows. Not that we don't learn a lot of other side venue truth, just like we learned a lot about love. He, he stopped and gave the definition of love. But he said, faith, hope, and love, are, these are greater because, because he says in the Greek, because they abide, they carry on. The other things don't carry on. And then he says, but love is even the greatest of those three. Why? Because it carries on forever. In heaven, you're not going to be having hope to see Jesus or hope for anything. It says it's the, it's the substance that we'll have at that point in time. So now is the day where we're having to put faith and confidence and hope and exercise faith. You won't have to then. Remember, it says the trying of your faith is more precious than gold. You have a time now to exercise faith. When you get to heaven, you won't be able to exercise faith like you can. You won't have to. You won't be exercising faith then. So I believe in the context, every one of these verses flow consistently. So he talks about getting special revelation in chapter 12. Special insights with knowledge and special prophecies that were coming in because all the canon of Scripture had not been put together. But he said, hey, there's something much greater than these gifts. It's love. And then he stopped and gave a little bit of definition. And then he says, but when the completion comes, or the perfect comes, which was always used to show maturity, or the same identical word as I said in James, where it was used to show the, the law, the complete law, the perfect law, when that comes, then he says, you won't need these special revelations or these special prophecies or this special knowledge. And by the way, if you think this means when Jesus comes back, that makes zero sense. Are you not going to have any knowledge when, when God comes back? Quite the contrary. Knowledge isn't going to cease when we see Christ. But it says here in, in verse 10, it says that knowledge is going to cease. Knowledge doesn't cease when it comes to Christ. It's referring to the knowledge, the special knowledge that God was giving until the canon of Scripture was fulfilled, not until Jesus comes back. Because when Jesus comes back, you're not going to be without, you're not going to be without knowledge. Jumping back up to chapter, at the beginning of the chapter 2. Some people think here that, that uh, uh, they speak in tongues because of this one verse that they're speaking angelic language. But I think every one of these points are, are hyperboles. It's quite obvious. Uh, if, if you're going to think that you're speaking in angelic languages, then you also have to go ahead and think uh, of the following verses the same way. You have to be consistent in your interpretation. Verse 2 says, If I prophesy knowing all mysteries and all knowledge. Do you have all mysteries? Do you have all knowledge? Nobody fits the category of knowing all languages, speaking angelic languages, having all knowledge, knowing all mysteries, can remove all mountains. That's not true in any case. So this is not trying to reinforce the fact. He's trying to express a hyperbole, which means an exaggerated statement to say, if you could do this, not saying you do do it, but he said, even if you could do this, if you don't have love, you're nothing. And it's worth nothing. And so in the context I don't think he's promoting this or even saying this. In fact, quite the contrary, it's, it's implied that nobody has this. Uh, in fact, even when they spoke in tongues, in the Greek here, it's every, man, it's every language, every human language. Nobody, they never spoke every human language uh, in, in the unlearned language, any more than somebody has all mysteries or all knowledge. So he's, uh, in, in this context, he's not trying to say this is an example. He's trying to say, 
this is so absurd, there's no way you could do this even if you could move every mountain and don't have love. You're nothing. Anyhow, that's a brief on 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, so why don't some of you all, if you have any thoughts on, on any of this. You know, the real thing is, in the context, we're learning a lot of understanding, and sometimes there's been a lot of confusion in this. And so I've, tonight, I've kind of tried to give an understanding of how these words are, but it's really exciting to uh, take the nuggets of love and let that embed in your life for really revolutionizing your life to be powerful and to be useful for the rest of your life and to, and to have influence in affecting people for the kingdom of God. But why don't any of you all, if you have some questions or you feel a little different, um, again, I think the, probably the biggest hang-up with some uh, that believe that tongues is in today the only way they can believe that is if in verse 10 the word perfect means Jesus Christ coming. And there's every verse, 20 of them, do not confirm that. They confirm just the opposite. So I, and in the context, all the verses around it don't confirm it. Let me tell you, though, when we get to chapter 14, you'll understand even further why this is not true. In fact, I think this is why tongues was the, considered the lowest, the least gift, because they were temporary gifts. And, uh, and here it says they're partial and they were, they were going to cease. Not when J Jesus comes, because it's not talking about Jesus coming, but when you have the full revelation. When they didn't have the full revelation, God had to give bits and pieces. He had to give partial with people as prophet, people would prophesy. They were getting bits and pieces. They were getting partial. When they got the whole revelation of God, i.e. all the scriptures, then you didn't need to have that special gift getting bits and pieces anymore. You still had prophets, and, and you still had knowledge in that sense, just like when Jesus does come back, knowledge isn't going to cease when Jesus comes back. So it's not talking about knowledge in general. It's talking about the gift of special knowledge that was coming in to fill in the gaps until the scriptures was fulfilled. Does that make sense? Any questions or additions or thoughts? You can, you can feel free to disagree with me. A lot of people do. It is kind of sad to me when I think about it. I mean, I have a lot of good friends that are charismatic Pentecostals, and I love them to pieces. In fact, some of them I, I think are uh, more excited about the Lord than some that maybe have certain theology right in, in other areas. Because, see, that's what it's saying here. The greatest is love. So you can think, oh, I know this, I know that. You may have better knowledge in something. But if, you don't, if you're not patient... God's much more pleased with the person that's patient and maybe often this or that or the other. If you're not patient, if you're not kind, if you get irritable, if you get upset easy, if you're not respectful, if you're not mannerly, if you're rude, I mean, that's far more important than all these gifts. All of them put together. So let's be sure and not lose that thought. I can hardly wait to get into 14. It's really hard to share this bits and pieces because you really need to get the whole flow. A lot of what I've shared the last couple of weeks fit in with this, but when you just kind of get a, a snapshot, it's a little hard. I'd like to if I had the time. I won't take the time tonight. But if you realize in chapter 12, you're reading down where it's talking special revelation, special knowledge. It, it flows and you understand that. And, uh, but then he says, look, I don't want you to seek those gifts. I want you to seek the greater gifts. It's because I think, as he says here in chapter 12, because I think he knew they were going to go away. It was only for a limited time. It's kind of interesting that the gifts that people promote today are the least gifts. The ones here in chapter 13 say are going to cease. And in chapter 14 say they're only for a, a, a small race of people on planet Earth, i.e. Jews. That's pretty incredible. And it's very clear as you get into 1 Corinthians 14. Even if you don't understand certain areas about tongues, there will be some fundamental areas you'll understand when we get into chapter 14. The foundation of what Paul gives the foundation. Let me just add, isn't it interesting here in chapter 13 where he talks about when I was a child, I used, to, I used to talk or speak or make sounds like a child. I used to think like a child. I used to act like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. The same scripture, the same analogy he uses in chapter 14. In chapter 14, when he talks about tongues, he says, I don't want you to be like children. Like children. That's interesting. He ties it right back into being like children, 
when he referred to tongues because it was like children. It was the elementary. And a child is what? It's in the beginning of life. It's the beginning stages. Tongues, when it was uh, here on earth, it was the beginning stage for the church, the transition, when, it, when the church was a child. But he says, I, but I do want you to be children when it comes to evil. And they were using tongues in a way that was very arrogant and divisive. But he says, I don't want you to be like children in this area. And he says how oh, you're not to be like it in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. He says, but look what the law says. But look what the law says. You see, we go to the scripture to decide. If you decide by emotions, if you decide by some motivational speaker, if you decide by even miracles or things you see or experiences, your Christian life will be so unstable. Did you know in Matthew chapter 7 it says very clearly, and it will increase in the latter days, it says there will be miracles, there will be prophecies, there will be all sorts, casting out of demons. And he'll say, depart from me, Jesus will say, I never knew you because you did not know and keep the law of God. So I'm not going to determine my theology based on what I see, based on what I hear, based on my senses. This doesn't mean, by the way, that God can't do a miracle today, and God does miracles today. In fact, if you got sick and didn't die, you were healed, <laughs> or you would have died. God heals people. We'll get into that more later in detail. But God can do miracles too, mind you. But there's a difference between miracles that God may do versus the doctrine of the sign gifts. And that's where the confusion comes in. I believe God may do certain miracles at certain times, supernatural miracles at certain times. I don't have any question about it. I believe that somebody may, whatever you want to say, any miracle. But there is a distinction between God whenever he chooses to do some miracle or to heal you if you've been sick versus the sign gifts of healing, of, of speaking in tongues. And those, those distinctions, if you don't understand those distinctions, uh, it, it, it'll, it'll confuse you. By the way, when the sign gifts were active, you go to chapter 28 of Acts, it says everybody was being healed. There was no exceptions. Everybody. When Paul passed his handkerchief around, it went through the city. Everybody who touched it got healed. It wasn't. There was no debate in the world about the miracles when they were active. No debate. Even the heathen didn't debate it. They said, oh, the devil must be doing it through Jesus. Or the devil must be doing it through Paul. There was never a debate. And, by the way, there, it, no miracle was ever slow. No miracle was ever partial. It was always complete. And it was always immediate. So many say, well, I've, I'm better. I'm better. That's no miracle. That's the grace of God in natural flow. All the, you study the miracles. They're, they're, it's so incredible. It's so much different than what the so-called miracles are today. But that doesn't mean God doesn't do some actual miracles today. But the flow of miracles, like it was in the New Testament, during the sign gifts, it makes it very clear that it was for the Jews, not for the Gentiles. And here, I believe in chapter 13, it makes it clear that it was during this transition before all the, the, the complete scripture was given. In fact, it's very interesting in the scripture, even at the very end of the scripture, you know, Timothy was one of the last books that were written. And in Timothy, by that time, Paul listed off one man after another that he hadn't healed. All of them were godly men. If anybody deserved being healed, uh, he named three men that he wasn't able to heal, that he hadn't healed. So Paul himself, who later, when a snake bit him, was healed, healed other people. Anybody touched his handkerchief was healing anybody, but he couldn't heal Epaphroditus. He couldn't heal Timothy. He couldn't heal uh, one of the other fellows that he left back sick in, in uh, Miletus. Uh, or in Ephesus, I forgot which it was. So towards the end of Paul's life, you begin to see, just like it said here in the Greek, it would fall off. It would, it, 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 in fact, the word literally means that, kind of like decreasing, like, and it was, they were falling off, and, uh, and Paul himself was no longer doing it. Earlier, uh, whoever got in Peter's shadow, he would just walk down the street, 
hid his shadow. He didn't have to have a prayer meeting over it. In fact, everybody who spoke in tongues, they were never prayed for it. They never sought it. They never even were thinking about it. In fact, many of them didn't even probably know it existed. Some of them were Gentiles. Today, they have prayer meetings. They put hands on you. They, they work you up. It's a little program. They weren't seeking these things. In fact, maybe the, the error crept in later in Corinthians, and that's why he said, to, to, he said three times not to seek those things, but to seek to, be, to prophesy where you can edify and, and, and build up others. Okay, I won't keep going on this. Is there any other thoughts that someone would like to share or any other questions? And, and don't, you know, don't, don't, I really, don't feel bad if you question, you know, if you think different. I mean, that, that's how we'll learn. And mind you, I feel pretty clear about this, but I, do you know I'm 100% open to be changed? <laughs> In fact, I'd love to be, I've prayed to do all sorts of, I've prayed for every one of these gifts until God began to make it clear to me. I was, was a thousand percent. I'm still open to learning if, if I'm not right. But I don't base it on when people say, well, I've got this, I've got that. You know, there was all sorts of people that had things in the scripture. There was miracles that was done, for example, with, in Pharaoh's court. Uh, the, he brought his magicians in and, the, and their sticks turns into snake. However, Moses' snake ate their snake up. That's a side note. But still, it was pretty miraculous. I'd like to see you throw a stick down and turn into a snake. That was pretty incredible. So uh, Satan does miracles, and we know that for, for clear. So I can't determine it uh, by that. That's why we have the perfect, the complete law of God. And that's why the, this, this partial knowledge, this partial revelation, all that left because it was temporary when the complete came, and now we have the Word of God. And we see in Scripture it, that's exactly what happened. In the early part of Acts and right up near the end of Acts, which was at the beginning of the church age, it was incredible the, the sign gifts for the Jews that were taking place. Okay, any other thoughts? Andrew, do you have any thoughts, brother? Okay, does that make sense? Does that make sense, Laura? Madison, Lauren, Lauren, Sam, John, you have any thoughts, Dad? Well, you think if it comes. Okay. Well, when you can articulate them, feel free, Roland. James, what about you? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Have you heard this before, Winston? No. No. Okay. Well, we really need to have the whole sequence. When we get into chapter 14, we'll, we'll, we'll see a lot. Uh, we'll really see the foundation of this, and uh, we'll go from there. Okay. Maddie, do you have any thoughts? <laughs> It, it doesn't say the time of perfection. It literally is when the perfect comes. And the word, and I use... Well, see, actually the English word perfect is only a translator's. You could say when the completion comes. Uh, that, that would be an accurate translation. Or when, when the fullness comes would be an accurate translation. Uh, but a lot of English translation, and some use that, those words. Some of some, probably most translations say when the perfect comes. And part of the reason you need to realize, as I've shared with you with publishers of Bibles, <clears throat> sometimes they will intentionally use a word that is a valid word, but can be interpreted different ways because of different theologies that different denominations have. And their Bibles will no, not sell if, if they use a certain word that seems to counter that whole denominations. So what the publishers will do, and I know this for a fact, uh, what they'll do is they'll take a word that's maybe a that's an accurate word but a little more nebulous so you can kind of interpret it to fit into this denominational uh, group or this denominational group and that way they all buy their Bibles. So, uh, uh, so the word perfect, you can, what does that mean? I mean a lot of people think that means Christ and, uh, but all you need to do is look at every place it's used, and it's never used in reference uh, to Christ or Christ's coming. 
uh, I didn't look at every one, but I, I, well, I did look at every one, but I didn't read every, every uh, the, the whole context and all of them. But most of it, it means com what's complete or mature. The word, the word perfect? Or perfect? The word perfect. Uh -huh. See, and, and by the way, look at the rest of the verse. See, context is the best definition for words. The rest of the verse says, then the partial will be done away. Okay, if you're saying, what's the opposite of partial? Whole. Partial, yeah, of whole, whole. Yeah. absolutely. The very sentence, in the very sentence, it says, then the partial will be done away with. So what's the part, if, if the partial is going to be done away with, then the whole. So it's, we're not dividing Jesus, saying he's partially here and, and, and or he's uh, not complete. It, it doesn't refer to the person of Jesus because the very sentence would be inconsistent. The verses that precede it and the verses that follow it. Because if it's Jesus, and when Jesus comes, if it's the perfect meaning Jesus, then, uh, which by the way would have used a different word when every time it talks about Jesus coming, it uses his name. But if it was that, you wouldn't say, once Jesus comes, we'll have no more knowledge. Knowledge isn't going to cease when Jesus comes. Well, that's the point. See, it's talking about the knowledge where it was special uh, revelation, uh, partial knowledge that was, that was contributed during the early church age because they didn't have the full knowledge of the canon, the full knowledge of the scripture. So then is that the only place? But, 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 but you know what? The strongest thing on this is not 1 Corinthians 12 or 13. The strongest is when we get into 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14 is really the foundation for this subject. And, and, and the reason is, is because Paul himself says this is the foundation. And he goes back to the Old Testament. See, everything in the New Testament is based on the Old Testament. So if you miss the Old Testament foundation for any truth, you'll be a blur in the New Testament. The Messiah, everything about Christ, has its foundation from the Old Testament. Tongues has its foundation from the Old Testament. Miracles has their foundation in the Old Testament. In fact, in my little booklet, The Ten, for, uh, the Ten Prophecies of the Fulfilling of Jesus, the, all that foundation of those miracles, when he told John, who was in prison, and his disciples came, are you the Messiah? He, what did John, Jesus do? He basically, he basically confirmed his credentials on the Old Testament. Go back and tell John what you've seen and heard, i.e., the blind are seeing, the lame are walking, uh, the deaf are now hearing, the, the dead have been raised to life. And that was all foundational for the Old Testament. So the credentials of Jesus himself are given in the Old Testament. All New Testament truth is based on Old Testament truth. The only exception will be when Paul makes and, 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 and validates the exception. For example, 1 Corinthians 7, when he was talking about marriage, remember? He said, the Lord says, the Lord says. And then he said, the Lord didn't say this. this there was new revelation that Paul gave that was, was not based on the Old Testament, which was kind of interesting. And that's, in fact, that's made the only place that I know that that might be the, the case, because it's pretty unusual. So if you've got, if you don't have the Old Testament foundation, you'll really, really be confused really be confused. The foundation for all the, for all, the tongues specifically is identified, but really all sign gifts, the foundation for that is for the Jewish race. And by the way, it's interesting, uh, uh, when, uh, when Israel finally was destroyed, the temple and the nation in 70 AD, that was the final judgment. And tongues, by the way, it, uh, in the Old Testament basis, was a part of the judgment that was being shown. They were, because the Jews were proud of their race, they were proud of their language, and God was now starting to speak uh, with the languages of other people. And that was, a, that was a, in one sense, a judgment to Israel because they were rejecting the Messiah. So it had kind of a, a more implications than what a non-Jew today would think about. And and, and as it came close to 70 AD, when finally the nation of Israel was destroyed, those, those, those special gifts that were the sign gifts for the Jews uh, began to literally, as it says, fall off. Even biblically, they began to fall off. So.
So is that the only place where they set, where it says it will seize, where it says these three will seize? Well, it doesn't say these three will cease. It says, well, it says where, where these three will cease, love, love will never cease. Well, it says the greatest of these is love. And I, and I think it's because, uh, uh, you see, in each case, he's, he's, why is he talking about the greater gifts, being apostle, prophet, evangelist, compared to uh, tongues? It's because they were temporary, apostle, prophet, and evangelist, or teacher, will continue to go on. So then he says, but now faith, hope, and love abides or continues. But now the greatest even of these is love. And I'm just saying, I think it's because love goes on for eternity. In heaven, you won't be having faith because you'll, or hope, your hope will have arrived. The fulfillment of that will have arrived. So, uh, but love will continue on for eternity. So that's why love is the greatest. But faith, hope, and love are greater than those temporary gifts because they would carry on through the rest of the church age where those temporary gifts would not. And that's why Paul said to desire the greater gifts. They were greater because they would carry on, uh, maybe for other reasons, but certainly because they were permanent. Okay, any other questions? But I'm saying that's the only place where it says those, those three sign gifts will cease. Correct? That, uh, that's actually, yeah, yeah. that is strong evidence. That's the, the only verse I've ever seen where it says they cease, even after going through your tongues book. Yeah, I didn't, even, I didn't even talk about ceasing because if people understand the purpose of tongues and who it's written to, then it's not a debate whether it exists or not. It's, 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 pretty, uh, it's pretty, pretty simple. James, James, don't do that. Did that answer your question, Maddie? Did you have, James or Maddie, did you all have any more thought on that? No, yeah. I wasn't thinking that that was not what it was saying. I never would have thought that on my own reading that. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know which translation you're using, but uh, I, think, I think it uses the word perfect, and, and a lot of them use the word perfect. Oh, it says, that, well, the New Living is really, the New American's better. That, the, the, that isn't even in the Greek, the time of. That's, that's kind of the, the Living Bible, uh, the New Living Translation, and the uh, Living Bible um, take a lot of liberty and, and, and don't. If you, if you want to study the Scripture, you probably need to look at more word-for-word uh, -word translations. And the New American, of course, is one of the better ones. Even the, uh, even the New Authorized, the King James, and uh, the New English, and some of those. But the, the Living Bible and the New Living Translation uh, add a lot of words that aren't even in the, the, the Greek. In fact, many times, the Greek is, is, is pretty precise. It's very short. Uh, there'll sometimes be one word, and, it'll, and you'll have to, most English texts will put two or three words around the English word, the, the Greek word. Uh, it's more wordy than the Greek, which is kind of interesting. So you need to look at it in the, it just says the perfect comes, when, when the perfect comes. It actually doesn't even say it that way. I think it says perfect comes. <laughs> so it's just, but, but, but again, the word perfect is just an English uh, translation of it. You could say when the completion comes, when the full amount comes, when it gets mature, because that's how the word was used. As I said, notice that the, the publishers will oftentimes use a word, can you stop them from doing that? Will oftentimes use a word that can be kind of nebulous so you can, so any, any denomination can kind of take their interpretation. But you have to decide an interpretation. You can't just be nebulous about it, it's talking about the complete. So you have to decide if it's talking about the mature Jesus coming, uh, or, or something else. And uh, most, uh, just to let you know though, most Bible scholars either me think it means Jesus coming back or the Word of God. I've never heard of anybody thinking it means anything other than those two. And I think, it, I think it's pretty clear it's the Word, because I think a lot of things would not make sense if it was, if it was otherwise. But uh, anybody that's in the charismatic movement, uh, Pentecostals, they will have to interpret it as Jesus coming. Because if they, 
if they don't interpret it that way, then those gifts, then sometime those gifts are going to cease uh, prior to uh, uh, Jesus coming. It'll, so they have to interpret that as Jesus coming. And, and, and that's what they do. And, and I don't look down on any that d do that. I don't think it's right. I don't look down on it. Nor should we ever divide from any. Uh, I feel as close to a charismatic brother as, a, as I do to any of you that would agree with me 100%. Our love and our relationship is not based on <coughs> some of our theological thinkings. It's just like a family. <coughs> Everybody in a family may be different. They may be different sizes. They may be different sexes. They may have different opinions on things. But because they're family, we love one another. And so it should be as a spiritual family. It is tragic. Most Christians divide over if you agree. They're, they're united like heathen. Heathen unite based on if you agree. If you like what I like, we're united. But Christians shouldn't be that way. We should be united because we're blood brothers and sisters by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that doesn't mean to promote some believers or some groups that may be teaching wrong in different areas. It doesn't mean you have to embrace that uh, different areas of teaching. I think like Jesus gave the best example, his disciples were out and there was other people that were doing miracles and, and, and they rebuked them because they weren't with Jesus. They came back and they told Jesus, uh, we rebuked them, they were doing these miracles and in your name. And Jesus said, don't, don't rebuke them. If they're not against us, they're for us. But he never told his disciples to go join that group. He never said to follow them. But he said, don't be against them. If they're not against us, then they're for us. So it's interesting, uh, the attitude he wanted to have towards them, but he didn't tell them to go join them. Yeah, obviously, they would have been very uh, uh, misunderstood. They needed to stay with uh, Jesus and those that were following Jesus more closely, but have a loving attitude towards others that were using his name uh, and weren't following Jesus as closely. And when we get to heaven, we'll all see none of us are, are perfect in our following uh, of, of the Lord Jesus. So, uh, you know, so that's not the relationship. So a better way to say it is when the canon is complete, right? Well, the, you could say... That's what I was trying to say, you're saying. Well, that's what I think, because that's why there was special revelation that was giving. The special knowledge that was coming in, it was, it was limited knowledge, it was partial knowledge versus the full knowledge of God. And with the Scripture, mind you, think about this. Do we have the full knowledge of God with Scripture? We do. And how do we know we have the full knowledge of God? How do we know we have the total knowledge of God with the Bible? Here's how. There's many verses, but there's, here's one of the most obvious, and you all know it. It's in John chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the same, it says in verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And, uh, and that's why His Word is, the, uh, is complete. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He manifested the Word, but it says He was the Word. And so the Word of God is complete. In eternity, we will see that the Word is infinite. Infinite. How many times? I've read some verses thousands of times. And after a thousand times, I got something out of it I never got 50 years ago. How does that happen? It's infinite, just like Jesus. God is infinite. You'll be shocked to discover that His Word is infinite. And He's going to teach you with His Word. In fact, it says when He comes back, He's going to rule the world with His Word with the law, with the book we've got in our hands. It's all there. So if we don't understand something, and it says all wisdom is hid in Christ. And Christ, he said, was the Word. So he, his whole self, and remember, when Jesus was on the road of Emmaus after he resurrected from the dead, he didn't just start spewing things off the top of his head. It says very clear, and he started to go through the Scriptures. Everything he shared was from the Scriptures. Now if God had extra scriptural stuff. Why didn't he give a lot of extra scriptural stuff? It's very clear on the road to Emmaus. It says, and he went through the scriptures, and he started with Genesis, and he went through the scriptures. He was laying out the scriptures, and it told all about himself in the scriptures. We don't realize how power, we, you know, we really don't realize the scripture. Isaiah, that's why God said, um, to this one I look, who trembles at thy word. Samuel, 
He didn't let one word drop to the ground. So I, I really feel the word is infinite. And God, it's very interesting too. See, it says God opens our minds to understand the word. In Daniel, he said, some of that he wrote, you won't understand. God's going to keep it closed until a later date. So some of the word God chooses to open our mind to let us know it, and some later date he's going to let other be known. There may be scripture that God has not opened up to us today. There may be. I, I can't say. Only God, you know, God knows. I mean, we may think it's all open to us. It's all available to us. But, it, but the Lord says he, he shut up some of it to not reveal it, to not open it up until the latter time when that is. I, I personally think a lot of that is opening up because it, I think we're in that time. But only God knows. Anything else before we close off? Lord, we thank you for your word, and we just pray that we will be anchored on your word. Remember Paul, he, he said they were more noble than the Bereans. The, um, uh, than the, uh, the Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians because they searched the word to see if these things were so. They didn't pray to see if these things were so. They didn't listen to the Spirit to see if these things were so. They searched the word. God, you said try the spirits. And the way we try the Spirit is by the Word of God. You said, don't, you said to not despise prophetic utterances, but prove all things. Hold fast to what's good. Lord, deliver us from thinking uh, or making any kind of decision based on anything but your empirical, objective Word. I think of Proverbs 3 where you said, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. All your ways acknowledge Him. So Lord, help us to not lean to our own understanding. Help us to search the Word. Help us to realize <clears throat> that the Word is a sure foundation and that the Word is living and the Word is powerful and the Word is eternal. <coughs> and uh, so, God, we just thank you for your Word. And most of all, I just pray, God, that we will, uh, as we desire, that we will desire indeed the greater gifts, but above all of that, that we will pursue love and we will uh, have all the attributes of love. And we just confess, every one of us in this room, just together, we confess how far short we've fallen in this area to be patient, to be kind, to be polite, to be courteous, uh, to think the best of one another, to cover one another, to defend one another, to, to forbear with one another, uh, to, not, uh, to be faithful in loving one another. Lord, I confess, Lord, I just acknowledge uh, uh, that I fall short in this so many times, but Lord, I, I long for this more than anything else. And I pray that each one of us here will long for this, God, so that our life, we won't wake up and see, God, if we could have moved mountains, uh, if we had all faith, if we had all knowledge, but we don't have love, our life will count for nothing. And so, Lord, so many people today want meaning. They want purpose in life. Lord Jesus, you said if we love, we'll have meaning. If we love, we'll have purpose. So I pray, fill us with love. And tonight, as we take time to remember you, you're the God of love. And Jesus, you manifest that love. And you said to remember me every week we come together. And we want to take some time every week just to remember you, just to think about you, to break bread, to remember your body that was sacrificed, to take this cup that represents your blood that was poured out, your lifeblood for us. And we just thank you for that. You loved us so much. Uh, Lord, just uh, help us now to follow your example and just help us as, as priests, all of us in this room now, to offer up our sacrifice of praise to you, uh, which is our holy service. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>